warm welcome to you. It's good to see you as we gather together to worship the Lord and to bring praise and honor to him. By way of announcement, just a few things, a few reminders. The regular things, Sunday schools and prayer meetings as normal. Um, choir practice from next Sunday, the 20th, Sunday the 20th, 4.15, in preparation for carol service on the 18th of December. So the choir practice beginning next Sunday afternoon. Um, mission envelopes for this month go in to support the Montgomery's in Mayo, uh, serving there with OMS mission. Then tonight at 7, Youth Fellowship meets over in the attic at Tartarahan. That's for those first year, secondary school age and upwards. That's tonight at 7. And tonight at 7.30 in Derry Cruz, Stanley Kyle speaking from Belfast City Mission. And campaigners is normal on Monday. And then that event on Monday, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow also at 7.30, hosted by Portadown Elam, the organisation Home for Good, an information evening hearing in regard to fostering, adoption and supported lodging. So that's tomorrow evening, 7.30 onwards. Um, campaigners on Tuesday, again as normal, Midweek meeting on Wednesday for prayer and Bible study in Kinnego Hall, and the, the football on Thursday, and the CEs on on Friday at seven. But no youth club this coming this coming Friday. No youth club this Friday. And then Tuesday week in Drumminnes in the afternoon, an event there organised by Presbytery, Ian Reverend Ian Harbinson speaking about his cancer journey, and it's a, a Presbytery event seeking to help others going through such troubles or maybe loved ones caring for others or for anyone that wants to go. I've heard Ian speaking in relation to his own experience and the, the, the gospel being brought to bear in it. So it's been very helpful to hear him uh, and I commend that to you. Wednesday the 23rd, then this Wednesday week, it'll be a joint midweek in Tartarahan Hall. Leslie Reed updating us as to Mexico City and the work there. Uh, and then also his situation currently uh, with OMS in Ireland. So that's Wednesday week, Leslie, bringing uh, an update uh, for us. Thursday week, Kirk Session at 7, Committee at 8, and then the, the other things there, as we've mentioned before. Thursday, the 1st of December, uh, at 7 p.m., will be a Christmas congregational get-together, and thanks to those who are organising, particularly PW, putting work into organising that. There's a sign-up sheet for that in the vestibule table this morning, uh, if you can consult that. It's not what we did pre-COVID with outside caterers coming in. It's in-house uh, and uh, lower cost as a result. So uh, thanks to those making preparations for it. But the sign-up sheet there in the vestibule in regard to that. And then the Sunday School... I want to pass on there. Thanks for the, all the support yesterday morning with the breakfast. Uh, £640 has been raised for Madlug and all their missions that the Sunday School are supporting. Uh, you can obviously contribute to that if you speak to Zara or some of the other Sunday School teachers. I'll get this wrong, but Madlug, the abbreviation MAD. Um, what is MAD? That's left me already. Make a difference? Make a difference and the lug for luggage. So make a difference luggage. So that's what the, the, the title means. Thanks for the help. On this Sunday, as we think of remembrance and this Sunday that is marked in our society as Remembrance Sunday, I'm glad to turn again to Psalm 46 and verse 9. And that great reminder that God makes wars cease. He brings them to an end. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. And may God move in mercy to bring wars to an end, even this day that rage around the world. And so, as we remember those who laid down their lives for us and for our freedoms, ask the congregation to stand, and uh, Jack Irwin's going to lay the wreath. The congregation, please stand. Let us remember in the silence.
for our tomorrow they give there today. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. In First Timothy 2, we're urged to pray for all people, for kings and those in high positions, so that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we do pray for the people of our nation, for the light of your salvation to flood into minds and hearts and souls, for hearts that are troubled this day to be able to find peace in you, to turn from themselves and to trust in Jesus. And we pray, Lord, for king and for government. We pray for royal family. We pray, Father, for a move of your spirit. O oh, gracious Lord, save those in places of authority in your mercy. Turn their hearts toward heaven and grant them to know the greatness of your salvation and to know that you alone can save and that we are not saved by the strength of our own might, but only by the might of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our call to worship comes from Matthew 11, as we think of Sabbath rest. And Jesus speaking in that context of the Sabbath. And he said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We're going to sing, O God, our help in ages past. Let us worship God. Let's bow together in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, that we can speak and sing of you, guarding us, guiding us, being our eternal home, our dwelling place. What a thrill our hearts this day afresh. Then we thank you that you grant rest to your people, that you draw near to us in your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for the freedoms that we enjoy in this land. And may we realize, Lord, that the price that was paid, humanly speaking, for these freedoms. May we cherish them, may we uphold them, may we uphold the right to the freedom of worship, and may we enter into the joy of that freedom that is in Christ alone. 
for truly only Christ can set the captive free. And Father, we pray this day for that move of your Holy Spirit in our lives to change us, to make us over anew, to enable us to rejoice in you. Oh, that we would be a thankful people. And Father, we pray, forgive us our sins, for our sins are many. And we seem to make everything about ourselves instead of about you. And so we pray, Lord, that you would come and show us our great need of your salvation, our need of your grace. Move by your Spirit in our lives, O God, we pray. Thank you for this great call of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus, calling us to come to him. If we be weary and burdened, heavy laden, come to him and find rest. Find life in all its fullness. And we thank you this day that we can taste of that reality. Looking forward to the fullness of it all when he comes again in glory. And when all our sorrows shall flee away. When every tear shall be wiped away. For those who are trusting in him. Lord, we thank you for this weekly pattern of seven days. For this one in seven that is set apart as holy and blessed and precious. We thank you for the Lord's day. And we thank you for the joy that we find in the Lord of the day and in his day. Father, may that day of blessings here and now open up to us by your gracious spirit. And may our hearts delight. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. We read from Genesis 2, verses 1 to 3, and then Mark chapter 2, and verse 23 to 28. The chapter breaks here would be better if these opening verses were still part of the previous chapter, because while we would speak of day 6 and the creation of mankind as the crowning glory of creation, yet day 7 is the joy of it all, and it's the, the highlight then of entering into the joy of God in his creation. So day seven, very much part of all of this. Genesis 2, verse 1, let us hear God's word. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. And then turning to Mark chapter 2 and verse 23 to 28. Mark chapter 2 and verse 23. One Sabbath he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Amen. And we thank God for these readings from his precious word. Girls and boys, it is great to see you here this Lord's Day, this day we, we call Sunday, but really it's the, the Lord's Day is the name we ought to give to it. We sometimes call it the Christian Sabbath. It's great to see you here with us to worship God and to meet around his word. And for those of you that are studying that little first catechism, question 90, what is the fourth commandment? And I'm sure some of you could tell me from memory what is the fourth commandment, and hopefully some of the older people could do likewise. But you've got the words there, if you're able to read it, well, we'll say it, I'll ask the question, and we read together the answer. What is the fourth commandment? The fourth commandment is, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. 
In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. That fourth commandment speaking of a blessed, a special set aside day, a day blessed is a day packed full of goodness. God is packed full one day in seven with his goodness in a special way. All the other six days were good. There was nothing wrong in creation with six days. They were all good. There was no sin as originally the world was made in these six days. But this one day in seven was special. The next question and the next slide brings up four questions. And I'll read through all four questions. If you say the words in bold with me, if you're happy to do that, we'll recite the answers to these four questions. Question 91, what does the fourth commandment teach you? To work six days and keep the Sabbath day holy. Question 92, what day of the week is the Christian Sabbath? The first day of the week called the Lord's Day. Question 93, why is it called the Lord's Day? Because on that day, the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Question 94, how should you keep the Lord's day? I should rest from my daily work and faithfully worship God. And girls and boys, as you grow up, you'll discover that Christians and genuine Christians have different views about what we should do or not do on the Lord's day, the Christian Sabbath. And you'll have to come to a view in your own mind as to what the Bible teaches. And it's about what the Bible teaches, not what your own mind thinks is good. And genuine Christians will come to different conclusions. But I'm very thankful for the reform tradition I grew up in, and I'm very convinced that the framework that it gives us is biblical and healthy. And a, a little bit from a slightly different reformed outlook than our own, the best day of the week for parents to read with children about the Lord's Day or for children that can read for themselves to read the best day of the week. A great book, the man that wrote us. His first name's William, and his second name is spelled B-O-E-K-E-S-T-E-I-N. So I'm not sure how to pronounce that. But William has written a great book, slightly different reform tradition, so a few little things you'll notice are different. It's the best day of the week, why we love the Lord's Day, and a great book for parents or grandparents or, or children to read for themselves. The best day of the week. And I hope and I pray for you, girls and boys, that as you grow up, the Lord's Day becomes the best day of the week. That is the day that you love above all days because the Lord of the day is the one you love. Now, when I was growing up, I didn't think of Sunday as the best day of the week. When I was growing up, I was just looking forward to getting through Sunday school Bible class and be old enough to stay at home with dad in the farm and just forget about all that other stuff. That's where my mind was. Because at that stage, my dad wasn't at church every Sunday. Now, I thank God that that changed as the years went by and he became one of the most regular of church attenders because God had intervened. But he was just so busy. It wasn't that he didn't think he should have been at church in those early years with us. He just was too busy and literally too busy. But I was just waiting to get home, finished with Bible class, and then I'd be finished with church. And thank God, God intervened. God stopped me in my tracks and God saved me. And a day that I didn't delight in became a delight because the Lord became my savior. Now I don't think I perfectly keep the Lord's day. And if anyone here thinks they perfectly keep the Lord's day, the Christian Sabbath, you're deluded. I don't think I perfectly delight. I do not delight in my Lord with all my heart the whole day long. I wish for a day and it will come in glory land when we will do that. We will perfectly delight in our God and Savior forevermore. What a day that will be. An endless day, an eternal day. But this one day in seven is precious. It's given as a gift for us. And it's not the seventh day now that we meet on. That was the Jewish, the Old Testament Sabbath from Friday evening to Saturday evening. But it's the first day of the week. And why the change? Because Jesus rose from the dead. He entered into his rest and the joy of it all on the first day of the week, the Lord's Day. And so the early Christians met on the Lord's Day. It's the special day now. It's the holy day for us. It's a precious day. And parents, think about 
how you might fill this day, this Lord's Day, with special things so that young ones growing up realize it's a special day. It may be that they have special clothes to wear on this special day. That's not a thing to, to throw out of the window. Some maybe think that's silly in the present age. But to set this day apart is special in their minds. We, we often meet together in, in homes on a special meal because it's a special day. Maybe what you didn't get the rest of the week at dinner time, all those desserts that maybe we don't need every other day, we get on this special day because we're marking out in our homes and our way of living that this day is special. It's a special day. It's a holy day. It's the Lord's day. And a whole lot of different ways that you can mark out this day is special so that young ones growing up realize that this is not a day to be dreaded, but it's a day filled with delight. You know... Parents, grandparents, if little ones see that you delight in the Lord of the day, they will realize it's a day of delight for you. If they see you just slavishly trying to live out a list of rules, they will realize it's just a list of rules. And they will come to hate the day, or else they'll become little legalists that think they're good when they're not good. Think about the way you live out your life before them. A special day because the Lord is special. The best day of the week. May it be that early in life, little ones growing up among us, realize that this day is precious. And while we may aim for an hour of public worship on the Lord's day, be mindful it's the Lord's day, not the Lord's hour. It's the Lord's day. It's the Lord's day. It's a precious day. It's precious. We're going to sing of this reality. This is the day the Lord has given and we'll rejoice in it. Set our hearts to rejoice in it. Worship God with our offerings, then after that, children's church across in the hall.
In our prayers of intercession, we want to remember in particular those affected by conflict and wars, whether in our own land or in other nations at the present time. Let's, let's bow together in prayer. Our dear Father in heaven, in this scene of time, there are many troubles and many heartaches. And we look forward, Lord, to glory land when you will wipe away every tear from your redeemed eyes and there will be no more of those tears of sorrow and heartache and pain. But we thank you, Lord, that in this scene of time, you come to us and you wipe away our tears one by one, even day by day in the midst of the trials and the heartaches that we come through. You keep a record even of every tear that falls. And Father, we thank you for the tenderness of your love and the power of your comfort. And as we think of those in our province and throughout our nation and even this whole island who have been impacted by war and violence and have suffered much the pain of loss, Father, we pray that they will be enabled as we name loved ones to you, Lord, that they would find comfort this day in Jesus, your Son, our Savior, that they would hear those words of the precious Lamb of God saying, Come unto me, all who are weary, who are burdened, who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So help them, Lord, to lay their burdens down. We pray, Lord, that move of your Spirit in the lives of those who Maybe physical scars have healed for some, but the emotional scars and trauma remain. And as we name loved ones to you, Father, with such trauma, we pray, Father, that they will be enabled to lay the burdens down, enabled even to forgive as they receive your forgiveness, enabled to find a hope in the gospel of Jesus. Lord, move by your Spirit and transform their outlook, so that the hope of the gospel of Jesus will flood in and sustain them day by day. Father, as we remember on this day and remember wars and troubles in this province, there are many faces that come to our minds and to our memories. Those of our families are those who worked with us for those in our neighborhoods, those who even taught us in our schools and our Sunday schools, whose lives were, humanly speaking to us, it seemed cut short, who laid down their lives for our security. And Father, may we be a people who are thankful for the freedoms that we enjoy at the cost of so many lives. May we be a people who seek to live out our faith, caring for all, looking to the needs of all, treating all with dignity and respect regardless of a person's outlook or way of life, treating them with dignity and respect because they're precious to you and pointing them to Jesus who is the saviour for sinners like us. Father, we think of nations around the world today in turmoil. We hear of Ukraine again in our news, the great loss of life there and in Russia and surrounding nations. We think of Myanmar. We think, Lord, of countries in the Middle East in turmoil where lives are treated as cheap, and where there is much pain and heartache. And Father, we pray for your intervention mercifully in these situations. Oh Lord, we know that even in days of war, your church sometimes grows and flourishes in ways that we can't even take in. But yet you have taught us to pray for peace. And so we pray, Lord, those days of war will come to an end and that there will be settlements that are honourable and that lives will be treated with dignity. Father, it is your rule and your reign that we need. For you alone govern with justice and righteousness 
and perfection. And Lord, as we think of our own nation and how we often maybe think with pride as to how well we remember in our acts of remembrance. Yet, Lord, as a nation, our laws do not protect the most vulnerable in our society. And hundreds of thousands of little lives are ended every year in our United Kingdom. And there is no outcry. And so we pray for our nation, Lord, that there would be a repentance and a realization of how far we have strayed from what is right. That you would move in the minds and the hearts of those that legislate in our parliaments. That you would move in the mind and the heart of a king and his government. That a nation might turn back to your ways and seek your way. Forgive us, O Lord, and have mercy upon us according to your unfailing love. O oh, dear Father, even as we think of the acts of worship as part of these remembrance gatherings, Lord, how little of the light of Christ shines so often. Lord, in our current day, more and more it has seemed appropriate in human minds to mix together a bundle of religions as if somehow all are saying the same thing. We pray, O oh God, for the light of the gospel to shine and that a nation might realize there is but one way to God, our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father, we pray that your mercy would abound to us, that your word would come home to us in the power of your spirit, that you would guide our feet in the paths of righteousness, that you would forgive us our many sins, and that you would help us to point a generation rising up to the goodness of God and the goodness of your laws. Lord, help us in this incoming week to live for the good of others and the glory of your name. Thank you for being able to gather together yesterday morning and the encouragement of hearing of a work of compassion in the name of Christ to needy lives, Lord, many of whom move from home to home. And we pray continue to bless that ministry. And even the, the event tomorrow night in Portadown, bless that ministry to care for young lives in great need of help and encouragement. And so we pray, Lord, raise up those with a genuine love for the weak and for the vulnerable. For we ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If you turn to Genesis 2, the verses 1 to 3 should really be all part of the, what, the first chapter, really, these three verses, it's just the whole flow of the seven days. And this, the, the highlight now is mankind created as the, the crowning glory, the beauty of creation, the finishing touch in creation. And then, and then comes this special day of rest, of joy, of delight uh, for mankind to enter into. Remembrance and rest. And on this Remembrance Day, what a day to be reminded that we need to remember the Lord's Day and to rest. In the end of war, people entered into a rest. And as a result of the great victory of our Lord Jesus Christ and that battle of all battles on the cross and that work that was finished, laying down his life to redeem us. And he entered in to the fullness of the joy of his rest on Resurrection Day. And so a new creation and a new joy. John Newton, the man who became a slave trader, as you know something of his story growing up with a godly Christian mother and the word of God, sown and packed into his memory, catechism, scripture portions, hymns packed into a young life, but a mother dying when he was but a lad, but a young boy. And he ends up away at sea in the Navy and serving in different roles and becomes hardened against the gospel. And if he sees a young man trying to follow Christ, he sets out to ruin any sign of faith in Jesus. Sets out to ruin Christians. So far had he strayed from the way of Christ. And yet God in his mercy saved him, grabbed hold of him, turned his life around. 
the word that was sown into a young life comes back to, to speak powerfully. And as he starts to open up and study for himself and read again, God speaks by his spirit and convicts him of sin and convinces him that it is possible for even him to be forgiven and to be saved. And one of Newton's poems, many poems, and they became hymns for us, many of them. One I don't think we have sung, but a beautiful hymn in regard to the Sabbath, the Christian Sabbath. Here's a man who thought he could find his, his happiness in more and more stuff and, and succeeding at the expense of others. And then saved, he writes, safely through another week. God has brought us on our way. Let us now a blessing seek, waiting in his courts today. Day of all the week the best, emblem of eternal rest. And that first verse of that hymn sums up much of the Lord's Day, the Christian Sabbath. It's a day packed with blessing. It's packed with blessings for us to seek out and to, to enjoy. We wait, we trust, we look to him. We wait in his courts as we gather together. We wait upon the Lord to wait us to have faith in him, to trust in him. The best day of the week, a blessed day. It's the emblem of eternal rest. In other words, it's looking forward to glory land and to the everlasting day, to eternal happiness is looking forward and so for John Newton looking forward to heaven as a saved sinner looking forward to heaven this one day in seven was special a reminder looking backwards something precious in the present but a pointer looking forward as well to glory and if we're yearning for heaven if we say we're Christians and we're yearning for heaven then there ought to be a yearning for the Lord's day each week in our hearts it ought to be something precious What's special about the Sabbath, we might ask, in its origins? Well, the Sabbath is a creation ordinance. That's, that's reformed teaching. When I say reformed, I mean the background that we're from uh, in terms of their doctrinal standards in the Westminster Confession. The Sabbath is a creation ordinance. By that, we mean that it exists before the fall into sin. And in the beginning, God, when he made all things, there were certain ordinances or things that he established as the pattern for life. Can you think of the other creation ordinances? Before the fall, the things that God ordained. Well, work is one of them. Work is good. It's a creation ordinance. Sin marred our work and made it wearisome, but work is good. We were made to work in God's good design. Marriage and filling the earth. That's another creation ordinance before the fall. And Sabbath, the creation ordinance, this one day in seven, this day of rest. And what is its purpose? It's not that God got tired after six days of creating. He does not grow tired or weary. The rest is entering into his joy. He's ceasing from this creative activity, he has made all things, heavens and earth and all in it by the power of his word. And, and he sets within it a creativity. So people are creative and, and life flourishes because of his good design. But on day seven now, he, he rests. He ceases from his labor or he Sabbaths. On the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done and he rested or he Sabbathed on the seventh day from all the work that he'd done. And he blessed the seventh day. That language of blessing means it's packed full of blessing. He made it holy, that is, he set it apart as special. Because it's the day he entered into the joy of all that he had made, he looked at his creation and he rejoiced. And it was all very good. Now, not all Christians, not all genuine evangelical Christians think that the Sabbath is a creation ordinance for us. Uh, John MacArthur, who have a lot of time for, and as, as greatly he used of God in his ministry, reading and listening to his outlook on Sabbath. And if you haven't already discovered, you will as you grow up discover that the best that Christians with the best of intention of following Christ have different views on Sabbath, not only in how we live it out now, but even as it was originally given. MacArthur, I don't think, thinks it's a creation ordinance. Or in fact, he states otherwise. He says Sabbath was for God as originally designed. It wasn't for man. He says not until Exodus 16 is Sabbath for man. Now Exodus 16 comes before the fourth commandment. That's when the man is given and they're told not to gather it 
on the, the, the Sabbath because they'll have enough the previous day for two days. So Exodus 16 is about provision, God providing so that we don't need to worry on the seventh day because God will provide for us every day. He'll take care of us. And for others that follow that outlook that think that the Sabbath is not a creation ordinance and given for the good of mankind, I would, I would simply say, really, really. You think God in six days created all things and then on the seventh day rested, ceased from his labor and entered into the joy of all that he'd made and that he didn't tell Adam and Eve about it and they knew nothing about this Sabbath, this one and seven, this seven day pattern. You really think that God didn't make it known to these people uh, 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 that he has made. I find that an, uh, incredible to even think that. Adam and Eve knew all about Sabbath rest. It was made for them. We'll come to a verse that explicitly tells us that. So to think it was just God entered into Sabbath rest on day seven and not for mankind, I think is missing something blatantly obvious. But we all miss things that are blatantly obvious. John MacArthur would also say that Jesus abolished the Sabbath. I, I wouldn't agree with that statement either. Jesus fulfilled it. He did not abolish it. He designed it in the first place. He fulfilled it. So there's a difference in outlook of genuine believers and you will have to work through biblically what you believe the Bible is saying and seek to try and apply that to your life, which will be even more difficult. When we think of Old Covenant, Old Testament and Sabbath, don't be thinking that because it was later given as a commandment that it's something dreary and drudgery. God's people were never saved through keeping the commandments. They were saved by the blood of a Passover lamb. They were brought out of slavery. They were saved by the blood of the lamb. And then they were given commandments, God revealing his character and his commandments, giving them a framework to live by. And when he gave them the commandments, he also gave them the tabernacle, the sacrificial system, knowing that they could not keep perfectly the commandments. So there was sacrifice to atone for their sin so they could be in fellowship with him. But the commandment and the, and the fourth commandment on the Sabbath day was, was not to be something that crippled people, but it was to be something that was for the good of God's people, even in the old covenant. And so in Isaiah 58, as the prophets call people back to the covenant, that's the prophet's job to call them back to the covenant. Isaiah 58, 13 and 14, if you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, and the holy day of the Lord honourable. If you honour it, not going your own ways, or seeking your own pleasure, or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord. Delight in the Lord. And I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. It's a day of delight. Even back then, that's what it was to be, a day of delight, a day to rest from labors and to delight in the Lord, the Lord who had made us. And incidentally, under the old covenant, it's not just about creation, the Sabbath, it's about creation and redemption. For if you have studied the commandments and you've read Exodus 20, you will see as we read from the, short, or the first catechism, in Exodus 20, the fourth commandment, Sabbath rest, is linked to creation. Six days, God made heavens and earth and everything. If you read Deuteronomy chapter 5, again written by Moses, and you read there of the fourth commandment, you will notice a difference. And I hope you have noticed it over the years, the difference. Because in Deuteronomy, the, the reason given in chapter 5 in Deuteronomy in the list of the Ten Commandments there is because we have been redeemed the reason to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy is because God brought them out of slavery and set them free. So even under old covenants about creation and redemption, and it's about provision in Exodus 16, that God will meet our needs so we don't need to fret. So all these things are packed into Sabbath. It's a day packed with blessing. It's a day to delight in the Lord of the day. And language of Lord's Day is even in the old, in regard to the, the old Covenant Sabbath, the seventh day, the language of the Lord's day and Sabbath are used with, by the prophets, even Isaiah. So we, we see something developing there. And think of the Lord Jesus and the Sabbath. You want to know what it looks like to perfectly keep 
the fourth commandment, you look at the life of Jesus. Don't look at any other life. Look at the life of Jesus in the Gospels. He perfectly kept the commandments of God. He perfectly lived out Sabbath. With love for his Father in heaven, he perfectly walked this earth. Jesus declared to those who were accusing him of being a Sabbath breaker, they were looking at him and saying, you don't keep all the laws, we have wrapped the Sabbath around. And the laws he didn't keep were not laws God had, had given. They were added on things that were crippling the people with burdens that were not God intended. And Jesus declared the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, Sabbath rest is a gift from God. It's his gift to his people in creation. It's a gift, a gift to be enjoyed, to be entered into. And also, as we read in Mark chapter 2, Jesus is Lord, even of, even of the Sabbath, Jesus is Lord, we read in Mark 2. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. He's the Lord of the day. It's the Lord's day. And notice that while God gives the gift of Sabbath to man, and, and please notice that, uh, and go back to Genesis 2 and think about what some people say then, MacArthur and others, that, that, that this day was not for Adam and Eve initially. Jesus says the Sabbath was made for man. It would seem strange to me that God made the Sabbath and didn't give it to Adam and Eve to enjoy. It was made for man. They knew all about it from the beginning. The whole pattern of human society is based on seven day weeks. I think it was in the Napoleonic, Napoleonic period when Napoleon was trying to rule the world that he tried to establish a 10 day week thinking that would be better in the Soviet Empire certainly in its day. They tried to change things to a five day week thinking that would be more productive and better and then they moved when that wasn't working they moved maybe to a six day week and then they just moved back to a seven day week. And why is there a seven-day week pattern around the world? Because it's a creation ordinance. It's written in by God, even though people might want to chop and change at it. But while it's a gift from God for, for mankind to enjoy, it's not called man's day or woman's day. It's not called people's day. It's the Lord's day. It's the Lord's day. So... As we think of this precious day, the first day of the week now for us, it's not my day, it's not family day, it's not sports day, it's not like six other days. And you're maybe thinking, well, I, I, I don't follow that reformed outlook of thinking that the, the Lord's day, the first day of the week is a Christian Sabbath. Well, you're still going to have to do something with New Testament passages of Scripture, and you're going to have to come to some conclusion in your mind as to how to apply them. Because if there is a Lord's day in the New Testament, and there is, We'll look at some of those verses in a minute. The New Testament refers to the Lord's Day. If there is a Lord's Day, that means there is one day that is set apart as special. It's not that the other days were not to worship the Lord and to live for his glory, but other days are given to work and to the things that need to be done. And this one day in seven is special. There is a day in the New Testament recorded as the Lord's Day. In other words, a holy day, a special day. In Hebrews 4, verses 9 and 11, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest. In Hebrews, in that section, in Hebrews is the end of chapter 3 and, and, and chapter 4, the beginning of it, there's a whole section there about, about entering into God's rest, about, about resting. And, and the bulk of it is looking forward to that eternal day in Christ's glory land. When, when Jesus comes again in glory, he's looking forward to the fullness of it all. And I think nine times the same word is used, a Greek word that looks forward to the fullness of it all. But one time out of ten in that section of Scripture, a different word is used. Sabbatismos, I think it is in the Greek. A different word is used once when it says, there remains a Sabbath rest. And some of our translations, I think the ESV brings it out at that point, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. That, I believe, is about here and now. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. It's written in creation. It's written in redemption. There is a Sabbath rest, a one day in seven rest here and now that helps us prepare for the eternal rest of heaven. Jesus fulfills Sabbath. He does not obliterate it. He does not abolish it. 
Why is the Lord's Day the Christian Sabbath as we sometimes describe it? Why is it day one and not day seven? Now, some Christian Christians over the years maybe have sought to observe the seventh day rather than the first day. Some very, very few probably have sought to do that. And then other groupings like the Seventh-day Adventists, and some will debate whether they're a cult or not. And you can research all that they hold and believe. They certainly have some doctrines that are contrary to Scripture in regards to hell and their view on it and, and other doctrines and the role that they gave to the prophecies of a woman called, I think it's Ellen White, and her word, her prophecies really to some on a par with Scripture. They maybe don't all say that. So there's a variation within Seventh-day Adventists. But Seventh-day Adventists set aside the seventh day as their holy day, as did the Jewish people under the Old Covenant. Why do most Christians set aside the first day of the week? It's about fulfillment in Christ. We would expect a change with the coming of our Saviour. Acts 20 verse 7, on the first day of the week when we were gathered together to break bread or to meet together and meeting around the Lord's table, Paul talked or t- p- Paul taught and opened up the word. So the early Christians gathered on the Lord's day. By the way, most of them, as the church grew among the, the slaves of the Roman Empire in particular, they wouldn't all have the luxury of the, the day that we have to have a day off to, to gather together to worship. So early or late, morning or night, they would have found a way to gather together to worship with others the Lord who had saved them. First day of the week is the day that they met. 1 Corinthians 16, that instruction to set aside our offerings, our givings, the first day of the week to set them aside to meet the needs of others, the, the poor and the needy and brothers and sisters in Christ. So this first day of the week set apart. And Christ's resurrection was the beginning of a new creation. The consummation of Christ's rest as king so He dies on that cross for our sins. His body on the old Sabbath lying in a tomb, resting to that extent. His soul, as to the man Christ Jesus, his soul has departed to be with the Father in heaven. As to his human nature, we're speaking. And then on day one, on the first day of the week, he rises from the dead and he enters into the joy of his new creation So just as in the original creation on day seven, God enters into the joy of creating. So now on the first day of the week, Christ enters into the joy of his kingdom. And so we meet on the Lord's day, the Christian Sabbath. It's a transformative day. And there are hints of it throughout Old Testament, more than hints. I think even in Genesis 1 and 2, what was Adam and Eve's first full day? They were made in day six, but what was their first full day? It was Sabbath. Their day one was Sabbath. Their first full day of life, having been made in day six, their first full day of life, Sabbath. They know the joy of God's joy, and they live their life in the light of it. And then that becomes changed by the fall into sin. And so there is a laboring to enter into rest rather than resting and laboring out of that rest. The seven-day Old Testament feasts, uh, and there are several feasts, and they're week-long feasts, and sometimes when we read of Sabbaths, we're not reading of the weekly Sabbath, we're reading of these additional ones. Those seven-day feasts have an eight-day Sabbath, in other words, the first day of the week, and they're prophetic of the Messianic age. And so John chapter 7 and verse 37, the Lord Jesus, on the last day of the feast of of booze or tabernacles on the last day of that feast Jesus stood up and cried out so it's day 8 it's the first day of the week if anyone thirsts let him come to me and drink if anyone thirsts let him come to me and drink whoever believes in me as the scripture has said out of his heart will flow rivers of living water speaking of the ministry of God the Holy Spirit through faith in Christ and so those feasts under the old covenant with the eighth day Sabbath were pointers forward to this Christian Sabbath. Revelation 1 verse 10, the apostle John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. It's no coincidence he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He was setting that day aside to to focus on the word of God and to worship and no coincidence then that the spirit moves on that day in a particular way. And he heard, he heard the voice of God if you read Revelation 1 verse 10. 
So all these pointers to a day being changed. And then the early church meeting on the Lord's Day on the first day of the week. Our shorter catechism, question 60, how is the Sabbath to be sanctified or made holy? How are we to, to use it or write, in other words? The Sabbath is to be sanctified by a holy resting all that day, even from such worldly employments as recreations as are lawful in other days, and spending the whole time in the public and private exercise of God's worship, except so much as is to be taken up in the works of necessity and mercy. The works of necessity and mercy. That little summary is excellent. Those who went before us studied these things in great depth. And that little summary of works of necessity, there's some things that are necessary to do on the Lord's day and some things are not. And there's some things that are merciful to do on the Lord's day that we wouldn't otherwise do. And for some of us in our employment and things that we need to do out of necessity or mercy, that framework is, is a godly framework. It's what the Lord Jesus was doing when he healed on the Sabbath. He was showing mercy, showing mercy. And so there are some employments that are essential and needed and some that are not. And a few pointers just in closing. Do you try to observe Sabbath and Christian Sabbath out of love or out of guilt? Out of love or out of guilt? Is your desire to set this one day aside as special? If, if you're able to do that in some sort of fullness because your employment lets you, is your desire to observe it a, a love desire because you want to be with the one that you love? You want to be in the presence of the Savior you love. That's the very heart of Sabbath, to be with the Lord. A result of guilt, trying to live up to some standard that you think if you live up to, you will earn God's favor. You may well think, that you have kept the Sabbath day all the days of your life, that you never worked on that day, you weren't in employment where that was needed, you never polished your shoes on that day. Now, young people growing up today probably keep that, that rule, and that's not a biblical rule, but that rule that we wrap around the Sabbath, I doubt if many polish their shoes any day of the week now, never mind on the Sabbath. But we may have a list of things we think we have kept that we have never broken. And we may be deluded into thinking that we have perfectly kept the Sabbath day when others around about us have not. And there are some who think they've kept the Sabbath day and yet they have never, never come to know the Lord of the Sabbath. They have never entered into the Sabbath day and the joy of it all. It's just a day about rules. It's not about Christ for them. And if you think you're keeping a day with rules and you've never come to know Christ, you're missing out about what the Sabbath is all about, what the Lord's day is all about. It's about the Lord and delighting in him. It's about the Lord. Don't miss it. Don't miss him. He said, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Do you want to rest from the, the burdens of life and the six days of the burdens and find joy and greater fullness? With, set this day apart as precious, out of love for the one who loved you and gave himself for you. It's an activity that, that you're wrapped up, a selfish indulgence, stuff you do on the Lord's Day that, that, that isn't really necessary nor merciful. And it's just selfish indulgence because you want it to be your day and not the Lord's Day. And therefore you'll miss the joy of it. You'll miss it. Am I helping others by my example? Maybe you think, well, I'm free. I, I, I'm not bound by rules and regulations. I'm above all that and all this talk of Christian Sabbath. That's not for me. My theology differs from the ministers. Well, are you helping others by your example? Are you leading others by the things you do to come to know Christ and to delight in him and to worship him? Our disorder affects others. When our lives are out of order, it impacts others. Don't exasperate children growing up with a heaviness of hand and trying to get them to observe everything that you don't observe. Don't pretend to them that you perfectly keep the Sabbath. Rather, show them that this day is a day of delight for you because Jesus is your delight. Make it a day that's positive, full of good things. 
for them to enjoy. And pray that early in life they come to know the one who it's all about. A few years ago we read a, quite a bit about John Patton, that missionary from Scotland, to those little islands near, near Australia. Cannibalism was rife. There was no gospel witness or very little there. Anyone who tried to go was, was killed and many of them eaten. And one of the things, one of the marvels of the gospel going there and people being saved out of all of that was the Lord's Day. And Patton at one point, I think, came back to Scotland and saw how far they had strayed away from the Lord's Day and his blessing. He just longed to be back among those former pagan cannibals who now were delighting in the Lord in his day. Our disorder affects others. Beware judgmentalism, thinking that person over there, they really don't know how to keep the Sabbath, but I do. Sort yourself out before God that you might grow in his grace and delight in him more and more. You see, self-righteousness shows itself in various ways. There will be some of us, our self-righteousness will rise up and say, I'm really doing well at keeping that. I don't do all those things and I, I, I'm at the place of worship week by week and I'm reading my Bible and I'm do, doing well at it all. And very easily it can become about how well we're doing it at all rather than the Lord and the one who has done all for us. And we congratulate ourselves, comparing ourselves with others. But there's another form of self-righteousness. And for some Christians who think, well, I'm spiritual and super spiritual, and I'm above all that real stuff and regulation and trying to, to observe a commandment, I'm above it all. Uh, and that's a self-righteousness as well, just kicks in in a different way. And our self-righteousness will come in all sorts of ways. And the Lord's day will reveal it to you. If there's a day will reveal to you your sinfulness, your selfishness, it is the Lord's day. And as God reveals to us our sinfulness, he reveals to us his grace. And he says, come to me. And beware being a spectator of Sabbath rather than a worshiper of the Lord. Spectating, looking on, thinking, knowing, thinking we maybe know what it's all about, but never entering into the joy of it. And so ask yourself the question about things that you do or maybe think about doing on the Lord's day. Are they really necessary? Do they really help anyone else? Are the things I'm doing causing others to have to work so that they can't be here at the place of worship with us today because they're so busy running something to make meals for you or me to go out and enjoy and then they can't enjoy the Lord's Day? Do I really need all of that? Can I not make do at home with less? Do I really need to go to the shop on the Lord's Day to buy stuff? Can I not order my life the six days? Really, when we have a problem with the Lord's Day, quite often it's because we have a problem with the other six days and we don't order our lives or right. To delight in the Lord and to set a day aside is precious. In our culture, we are privileged and blessed because of all the history of, of God's providence that there still is this one day in seven. Many will want to treat it as their day. They'll treat it as a sports day a self day, whatever it is, but there still is this day. And what a, what a blessing it would be when Christians treat this day as precious. We're in danger of throwing it away completely. When Christians treat it as precious, that'll be countercultural. That will speak to the world. Those people are different. See, in the Lord's day, they're happy in Jesus and they love to be in his presence. And they don't need to go to the sports stadium for a fix. They don't need all that stuff. They set it aside and they're focusing on their Lord and Savior. And they're far happier than anyone else I see. Even in the midst of their troubles, they have peace. What's special about the Sabbath? Blessing, holiness, rest. It's a special day because the Lord is special. His blessing, holiness, and rest are worth enjoying. They're worth enjoying. Dare I say it? the gadgets that we have, we would do well on the Lord's day to, to minimalize, if not just set them aside completely. Some of us need to be on call, so we just can't switch the thing off completely, but just to set the thing aside. Set the things aside. Because I can tell you, they don't help me to draw close to my Lord. Even though I have Bibles on it and everything else on it, they don't help me to draw aside with God. They really don't. They distract me. They distract me. We're going to sing in closing when peace like a river.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen.